Welcome to ANN. This is Alexandra Talleyrand, September 15, 1840. We have a guest today from France who is absolutely positive that the institution of slavery results in less good work and increased idleness. He is a legal historian, anthropologist, and sociologist. He visited the United States in 1831 to 1832 during the presidency of Andrew Jackson and is now the author of two books, just translated into English called Democracy in America. Good morning, Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, bonjour, mademoiselle. The honor is mine. Mr. de Tocqueville, let's get right into your theory of what the result is of slavery on the people who run the institution in the United States that you have observed. Well, my first observation is since the founding of the colonies in 1776, those states that had practically no slaves had increased in wealth and prosperity more rapidly than those of the South that had had slaves. As a traveler, when I went down the Ohio River towards the Mississippi, I was on the steamboat on the Ohio River and saw the Kentucky banks. Their slaves were loitering about with seemingly nothing to do. On the north side, the right side, I saw fine crops covering the fields, new buildings erected with showing the industrious needs of the workers. It was uh, evident that they were doing much better and Ohio, even to this day, has more people. In 1835, its population was a quarter million more than Kentucky's and still increases today. What are you saying this means? Well, the contrasting effects of slavery versus freedom can be seen on these banks. On the Kentucky side, the South work is degrading. On the North, work is honorable. There are no whites working on the Kentucky side because they are afraid of looking and being treated like slaves. On the North side, in Ohio, one can see intelligent activity of all sorts. Yes, I can speak for that. I clean the studio every day. I sort the papers, mop the floor, feed and sell the horses, clean the stable. I work very hard and I expect a raise someday. Contrast that with a slave. Yes, Miss Flum, you work hard because you want to. And maybe someday or some year you'll get a raise because you're not a slave. Mr. De Tocqueville, let's get back to the Ohio River. What other differences did you observe? Well, the white man of the North Bank, he has to live by his own endeavors. He has to make his well-being the main object of his purpose in life. He lives in a country of inexhaustible resources, and there he lives and faces the challenges of the various ways of life. The American on the South, on the other hand, scorns not only hard work, and he, he scorns all enterprise which would require work for success. He lives in idle means and with the ease and with the tastes of idle men, enjoying things like horse racing and gambling. These descendants of former American nobility and aristocracy make idleness honorable. Poverty seems preferable to industry. So to him, there is no separation between a worker and a slave. They are the same. What a sick attitude. Where do you think this is going? I'll tell you, this is what I see. I see two alternatives for white people. First, free the Negroes and mingle with them, or remain isolated from them and keep them in slavery as long as possible. Some Southerners admit that slavery is evil. However, they view this evil as necessary in order to provide and to preserve their way of life. Any other immediate measures would terminate in the most horrible of civil wars. What about being kind to them and teaching them how to read and write? Or oh, the American of the South do not think they can mingle with them. They have forbidden them to learn to read and write. They don't want to raise them up to their level, but rather to keep them down with the animals or beast of burden as possible. That's why I keep my windows and doors closed, because of the violence that you mentioned in your book. Miss Plum, 
That's certainly a condemnation. Finally, what are the side effects on men and women of the white race for having slaves? Ms. Talleyrand, this is what I see. The American of the North doesn't see slaves running around every day. He learns the natural limits of his own power. He knows that if he wants to get others to help him, he must win their favor. And therefore, he is patient, he is tolerant, and slow to act, but persevering in his designs. In the southern states, on the other hand, man's material cares of life are satisfied by someone else, a slave, who can look after them for him. Free from these duties, he can turn to idleness and to other less defined objectives, luxury, excitement, and above all, though, idleness. Nothing forces him to make an effort and or to, to live, and having no necessary work, though, he slumbers, not even attempting to do anything useful. Incredible. You have quite a way with words. Merci beaucoup, mademoiselle. This is Alexander Talleyrand for Abolition News Network. You have heard French historian Mr. Alexis de Tocqueville predicting the most horrible of civil wars as a result of preserving slavery. Good morning. Kentucky's 1792 Constitution continued legalized enslavement of blacks in the new state. 1800 tax lists show 40,000 slaves. United States banned African slave trade in 1808, but selling of men, women, and children in the South continued. By 1830, blacks made up 24% of Kentucky's population. Kentucky Non-Importation Act of 1833 halted the transfer of blacks for resale. By 1850s, Kentucky was annually exporting between 2,500 and 4,000 of its slaves down the river to the large plantations further south. To prevent runaways, traders operating near Ohio River kept slaves shackled together in pens when not being displayed to buyers. Slave traders were often social outcasts avoided by all but fellow traders.